working on the mega bill in commerce and just finished that up. So anyway, with that um, committee, we finished up on um, last week. We did not have a quorum on Thursday to pass reg recommendations for n the Board of Nursing, uh, the Board of Veterans Affairs, and the Healthcare Stabilization Fund. Uh, were there any recommendations, committee? I have none either. Yeah. I, shall we make a motion? Is that what you're asking? Sure. I don't have recommendations, but I'd say for uh, the Healthcare Stabilization Fund, um, I, I make a motion to approve 22 and 23. You've heard the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And that was Representative Clifford seconded. Representative Ballard made the motion. Okay. Uh, I have a motion to approve Veterans Affairs, or which one did you have? Yes, okay. Veterans Affairs. Uh, here. I'll do Board of Nursing. Okay, very good. I'd like to uh, approve. I got the wording for it now. I move to approve the um, budget for Board of Nursing for 22-23. I have a motion. Second by Representative Lynn. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay. Mr. Chairman, it would be my honor to move to approve the uh, veterans uh, budget. I have a motion. I have a second. A bunch of seconds. <laughs> okay, discussion. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, very good. Thank you for helping us clean that up. I hope you all enjoyed your snow days. <laughs> Some of you stuck in snow drifts and a variety of other things, but and it was nice and warm too. So anyway, okay, with that, we're going to start um, on one of the big three, the biggest of the big three, and Megan is going to get us started off. Megan Leopold with Kansas Legislative Research will get us started off on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be reviewing the a budget for Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Um, this budget that we'll be reviewing in this committee, um, while the document that you have in front of you does include the environment, the Division of Environment's budget, what we'll be uh, reviewing for the purposes of this committee is only the health portion of that. So that includes administration, public health, and healthcare finance. I'll try to sort those out when I can. Uh, so on the first page, you can see the overall agency budget. I'm going to skip ahead to page five. I'm just going to quickly walk you through some of the tables so you see what's included in the document. Um, some of them I'll go over pretty quickly, but if you have questions, please let me know. Uh, the table at the top of page five is the expenditures by category of salary and wages, contractual services, commodities, capital outlay aid of, to local units and other assistance. Below that, you'll see the state fund general expenditures for the agency, and that's from 2014 up until the governor's record in 2023. On page seven is the beginning of the fiscal year 22 analysis for the agency. In fiscal year 22, the agency requested a revised estimate of 3.6 billion. That includes 821.9 million SGF for operating expenditures. This is an all funds increase of 226.6 million and an SGF increase of 1.7 million above the amount that was approved by the 2021 legislature. In the table at the top of the page, you can see the amount that was approved by the 2021 legislature. That was 
799 SGF, million SGF. Below that, you'll see the SGF reappropriations that were carried over from uh, state fiscal year 21 to 22. And those raised the approved budget to 820.2 SGF and 3.4 billion. In the next section, beneath that, it says agency revised estimate. You can see the other changes that were made to the agency's budget. These include uh, Children's Initiatives Fund reappropriation. There was approximately 10, or 10 million of uh, federal COVID relief funds in the administration department. And then another 125.3 million in the public health department. Below that number seven, you'll see the agency's supplementals. And I'll be going over those in more detail here in a minute. And then all other adjustments. In the section below that, you can see the changes that the governor made in her recommendation. Uh, the first line is non-recommended agency supplementals. This includes two supplemental requests from the agency that the governor partially funded and one that she um, did not fund for fiscal year 22. Below that, you can see the human services caseload adjustments. These are adjustments that were made based on the most recent caseload estimates in the fall. You can see it's a pretty significant SGF decrease, and that's because between the time when the caseload estimates were made for fiscal year 22 in the spring to the fall, we gained an additional two quarters of that 6.2% increase FMAP, which lowered the SGF expenditures by approximately $66,000 or million dollars. That's what most of that is. Uh, you can also see $50 million for Frontline Hospital Employee Retention Plan. That was $50 million that was approved uh, by the SPARC Task Force and then the State Finance Council. Um, there's some additional testing funds. Those are in the, the budget of the environment. And then some additional federal funds for consolidated health centers. So overall, the governor's recommended expenditure is an all funds increase of 151.2 million and an SGF decrease of 67 million. Uh, you can also see the agency includes an estimate of uh, 1,724 FTE positions. This is an increase of 123.4 positions above the number that was approved by the 2021 legislature. The changes include 12 positions in the administration function, 74 in Division of Public Health, and 45 in the Division of Environment. It also includes a decrease of eight positions in the Division of Healthcare Finance. I'm happy to stand for any questions on fiscal year 22. Committee questions on 22. Representative Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, why is the um, $42 million for federal funds for the COVID-19 testing, why is that in the environment and not in public health? The laboratory is largely covered under the environment's budget, okay. and so a lot of that goes to the lab. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Committee further questions? Representative Howerton. I'm not sure this is the right place, Mr. Chair, so if you'll correct me if I am incorrect. I see a lot of ads for KDHE on the vaccine. Where does that fit into the budget? Uh, are you referring to, you see ads on here, or you Ads on every time you log in to any kind of streaming device. Oh, like public service Amazon, yeah, Hulu. Okay. Where, where does that fit into the budget? So I will let the agency expand on that, but right. my understanding is that's um, all federal funds that have come in from uh, COVID relief. Um, and some of it is, I believe, being reimbursed through FEMA or has been um, asked to be reimbursed through FEMA. But the agency can say more about that. Okay, I'll ask them, thank you. Very good committee. Further questions on 2022? Okay, move on to 2023. All right. Fiscal year 23 starts on page 11. 
The agency requested 3.5 billion and that includes 815 million SGF. This is an all funds decrease of 152.7 million and an SGF decrease of 7 million below the fiscal year 22 revised estimate. So at the top of the page in the table, you can see that you can see deductions for the reappropriations. You can also see deductions for federal funds in the environment, public health. These are not so much funds that are being taken away. They're funds that were there in 22 that are just not expected to be available in 23. So it's just showing that difference. Below that, you'll see the governor's recommendation. The governor recommended 4.2 billion, and that includes 812 million SGF. This is an all funds increase of 666 million and an SGF decrease of 2.6 million. So again, in that table, you can see there's one non recommended agency enhancement. There's also a slight adjustment for caseload expenditures for fiscal year 23. Um, another slight adjustment for that 24-7 nurse pay plan. A slight adjustment for Consolidated Health Centers Fund. And then in line items 10 and 11, you'll see that the governor added 19 million SGF and 577 special revenue funds for Medicaid expansion. And then the line directly below that, you'll see there's an $87.5 million SGF decrease and then an $87.5 million special revenue funds increase. This is due to the uh, stipulations in ARPA that states who extend Medicaid, who have not yet extended it, are eligible for a 5% increase to the FMAP. And that remains in effect for four quarters after the state has extended, expanded Medicaid. So the uh, estimated savings for SGF for fiscal year 23 is 87.5 million. And that would be an increase of 87.5 million in federal funds. Chairman, sorry. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thought you, we had eight quarters of FMAP increase. Or if we if we skip the 22 year, does it go down to four quarters? Or maybe oh. I misunderstood that. I'm sorry. It's two years. So, well, it's eight quarters. two years. Right. So eight quarters. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? And at the bottom, you see the 65,000. That's the KDH lab, which is in environmental. So that doesn't count for us. All right, moving forward to page 14. Uh, page 14 and 15 list out the agency's supplemental and enhancement requests. Um, you can see that in fiscal year 22, the agency requested $250,000 for oral health school-based preventative services. There's also $107,000 for administrative hearing services. Um, there were three FTEs requested for the Medicaid eligibility program and healthcare finance department, and then two FTZ, FTE positions for the Medicaid pharmacy program. There's also a $1.0 million uh, supplemental request to extend Medicaid coverage for pregnant women. So this would extend the women's eligibility from 60 days that it is currently to a year beyond postpartum. Um, in fiscal year 23, you can see that the agency has requested um, an adjustment for the reduced resources. This is taking money that um, in the government uh, governor's allotment from uh, fiscal year 22 was moved to come out of a fee fund Rather than the SGF, the agency is requesting that that be funded through the SGF once again. Uh, there's a data center rate increase. This is to do with free fee increases in the Office of Information Technology Service Rates. On the next page, there's a description of maternal and child health home visiting. 
This is an additional 1.4 million. That's all from the Children's Initiatives Fund. And that would be used to expand the current home visiting program. Um, currently, it reaches about 11% of eligible families in Kansas. And with this money, they would be able to extend it to reach approximately 60. You also see the, the enhancements for oral health school-based services and the FDE positions for Medicaid, again, in 23. Uh, finally, there's a Kansas Modular Medicaid System, or the KIMS project. Uh, this is the overall information system that tracks claims. Um, it's used to ensure that um, services are being tracked and that the MCOs are being reimbursed at the proper rates. Uh, this is an ongoing project. The money would fund um, the time period between implementation and when CMS is able to certify the program. Um, until CV CMS is able to certify the program, the state is eligible for a lower federal match. So the money that is being uh, requested by the agency would pay for that in the interim while they're waiting for the certification. Uh, the system was planned to go live originally in January 18th, but that's been pushed back, is my understanding, to April. Finally, um, there is the extension of Medicaid coverage for pregnant women is included in fiscal year 23, and that's for the entire fiscal year. I'm turning the page to page 18. There were a variety of federal funds that have been received by KDHE in the last several years during the COVID pandemic. This chart lays out um, some of those federal funds that are included in their fiscal year 22 and 23 budget. In the first column with numbers, you can see the total award that the agency anticipates. The second column is what they have budgeted for fiscal year 22. The next column is what they've budgeted for fiscal year 23. And then the last column is a description of the funds. Most of these funds come with some pretty structured um, guidelines on how the money can be spent. So this outlines some of those guidelines to give, um, to give an idea of where those funds are going. On the next page, on page 20, there's some information about the federal, federal medical assistance percentage, or the FMAP. So there's been a, an extra 6.2% increase um, to the FMAP during the public health emergency associated with COVID-19. And you can see in the table that from that enhanced 6.2%, and then also how that's impacted the enhanced FMAP, which is the FMAP that applies to CHIP and a few other um, services and Medicaid program. You can see that the state overall savings is about 450 million. Um, I've since received some updated numbers with the most recent quarter ending in December, and that number has gone up to 519 million. explain what that is again I'm sorry I've gotten lost yeah page 20 I have it thank you okay and then at the the table <clears throat> the table at the bottom of the page shows um, the savings as divided by agency I wanted um, should point out that that top table for the FMAP savings, the 519 number that I just talked about, that's statewide. So that includes not just KDHE, but it also includes KDADS and then a very small amount from Department of Corrections. Um, on the next page, page 21, you can see the expenditures by program and FTE positions by program. The rest of the budget is broken down into the various programs. Um, I'm not going to go over them in detail, but I'll point out some of the highlights quickly. Um, on page 26, you can see the performance measures for public health. There's also a summary of the public health expenditures that breaks down those COVID funds in a more detailed way. 
Um, on page 29, you'll see the breakdown of the public health budget for fiscal year 23. This is all information that was included in the um, overall tables I went through. It's just a little bit more detailed. On page 31, there's a description of the healthcare finance and the programs that are within that division. And then on page 34, the performance measures. And then this budget, program budget also includes a breakdown for fiscal year 22 and 23. I'm happy to see in for any questions the committee might have. Any questions? Representative Helmer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had earlier tried to find out on page, sorry, I had earlier tried to find out on page 16 um, how I could find how many home visits were made to maternal and child health. Um, previously, just curiously. So how, if we are going to add more money into any of these entities, are we going to know that these home visits are being made to them? I can see overall that if something like this, these home visits, they could have an overall effect on a lot of different things toward a positive way. So how can we track and monitor that these home visits are actually being made? I can see them as a real positive if, if we can track them. So how can that be? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's all right, I would defer that to the agency. I know that they are tracking a lot of that information, um, but they could give you more detail about what they track and what they have available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you remind me why we have approximately 70 more FTE positions in the public health from 21 to 22? So the majority of those are related to the public health emergency. Um, there are a lot of positions, nursing positions, and again, this is something that, that I know the agency can provide. Um, I think they have a slide in their presentation about this, but um, contact tracing, vaccination, nurses for uh, testing and vaccination, things like that. So, so do we anticipate those positions going away with the end of the emergency? My understanding is that the agency is anticipating that when the federal funds are no longer available and those positions are no longer needed, they will go. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Chair. Any further questions? Representative Clifford. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm not sure if this is for Megan or for you. Uh, I had a constituent reach out to me who's involved with RFQHC in Finney County, and uh, they're looking for a, a large capital project to be done. So I assume that's through the SPARC committee that that would get considered and approved, would it appear possibly then like the KDHE lab entry on page 11 next year in the budget? Or where does that money get on budget for purposes of appropriations? It, it might be in there next year. Right now, it's just an application to the Sparks Committee. So who knows if it'll be approved or where it'll be. Right. I visited with them a little bit about that. Um, We'll see. It won't be in this budget here. Sure. Where does the Sparks Thank you. money? We do have some Sparks money, but it's just kind of a pass through, doesn't it? Just kind of pass through. Any Spark money that passed through the agency, like a good example is the uh, frontline nursing, that $50 million. That was passed through. There was a small amount for administration, but it was included in the budget. Um, but the Spark committee um, also provides a lot of money directly to to various state agencies, and that they have a website that gives a lot of information about that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Megan. Any further questions? Representative Howerton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I understand budgets, but maybe this budget is just too big for me to comprehend. So um, on page 27, mm -hmm. it has that there's $8 million in other Usually when I look at a budget, I think other is um, small incidentals. So 18 million seems to be a lot in other. Do you know what, do you have any idea what that is? Or is that a You're question on, for the agency? You're on page 27. 27. 
COVID relief funds other? Oh, okay. So if you look at the chart, that chart I have in there of COVID relief funds. Um, what page is that on? Sorry. That, it's more to help me understand what sure. other is. It's page 18. So you can see um, on that table that there are several funds that are very large. Um, and so if it was a, a really big chunk of money, then I, I divided it out and I put it in as a, a line item in here. So for instance, ELC and testing money in the Department of Public Health was 65 million. There is five millions for health disparities program. So anything that's included in the other category okay. is something that was below, well below $5 million. So it's like um, they, you know, they receive some money for um, maternal child home visiting or the infant toddler program that were, there are just so many programs that you're good. It's thank, chunked thank in there. You're helping me with that. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Oh, Representative. On. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if you had any, any insight into why the monthly Medicaid enrollment numbers are estimated to drop by almost 57,000 for the next two fiscal years. Thank you. Sure. Um, so during the public health emergency, there's um, a requirement that no one can be removed from Medicaid, um, even if they're not, if they're no longer eligible, um, unless they move out of state or they voluntarily leave. And so because of that, the case load of Medicaid has been rising pretty quickly. Once the public health emergency ends, then the agency will start doing redeterminations to look at um, which of the individuals on Medicaid are no longer eligible. And it's anticipated that many of them will no longer be eligible, and so the numbers will drop pretty quickly after that for a short time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions? Representative Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe this, I should wait for the director of the program, but on page 18, when I'm looking under women, infants, and children, the WIC program, and it says the voucher increase provides a temporary increase to the cash value voucher for fruit and vegetable purchases. Um, can you give me a breakdown on that, or should I ask the agency? Um, I would, I would ask the agency about okay. that it's it was a you know the federal the federal funds included uh, changes to many of the WIC benefits so they might be able to expand on that I will pursue that the re you know, reason why I'm sure when we have shopped in grocery stores we'll see items that's marked WIC and, and along those lines and I remember when they weren't allowed to go to grocery stores but now we even allow them to go to farmers markets and different places and so I'm just trying to figure out the cash value voucher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee, further questions? Very good. Thank you. We just blew through $4 billion just that quick. So. Just like that. <laughs> Very good. Okay, very good. Next, I have an update from Acting Secretary Janet Stanick. Very good. Thank you for being here. Uh, saw you Friday and didn't get a chance to say anything. We were busy. I know. Everyone's busy. Well, good to see you all. I think I've met most. I'm going to remove this if you don't mind right while I talk for a minute. Um, good seeing you all. I've met most of you, I think. I'm just here to kick off today for our presentation. Thanks for having us here. I'm starting week 10 in my new role. Um, I'll give an update and then you'll hear from Ashley Goss in public health. Sarah Fertig will give an update on the Medicaid program. Um, Dan, or excuse me, Mark Heim will give an update on the uh, from informatics and finance piece of Medicaid. And then Dan Timish, our chief financial officer for the agency, will continue. So the vision and mission of KDHE is to create support, create and support a healthy environment for all Kansans living in the state and, and to have sustainable environments. We do more than just health. We cover environment as well. And then our mission is to improve the health and environment of all Kansans. We have three divisions. We're known as a super agency, the Division of Public Health, the Division of Environment and Healthcare Finance, as noted. We also have an administrative department, which I reside in, legal services, 
budget and management, um, information technology, human resources, and communications. So um, we all have a piece of that administrative piece, and then today during the budget hearings, we'll cover only the public health and Medicaid divisions. Environments being presented in a separate um, forum. So on page five, you'll see how our agency intersects. Public health covers across the agency with between um, the Medicaid division and environment. We all touch public health in some way. Um, with manpower, recruitment, and retention of staff, a big issue for us all. And you'll hear more about that as the individuals and in the agency leadership team present that. Right now on page six, you'll see the latest report on the um, what's known as the Americans Health Rankings um, report, which comes out annually for the last 31 years. Um, our, our overall score for Kansas is 30th in the US with behaviors um, ranking 31st, social and economic factors 24th, uh, physical environment 39th, clinical care 31st and outcomes 33rd. There's a lot of data behind those numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, um, as we talk about health, we talk about the social economic determinants of health as well, such as transportation, um, food, safety in the home, and things like that, that KDHE is very concerned about. Behaviors category um, includes things like sleep, health, nutrition, physical activity, sexual health, and tobacco use. Um, and then the social and economic is noted, um, kind of the safety, community safety net um, aspects. The physical environment um, covers the air and water quality, things that are covered in the division of environment, climate change, housing and transit also come into play there. Clinical categories include all preventative type services like mammograms and colonoscopies as well as quality of care. And then this, I'll just touch briefly on the strengths um, and weaknesses for the state right now based on the rankings report and where we focus our work and how we prioritize. The strengths are low income inequality, low prevalence of severe housing problems, and low prevalence of low birth weight. Challenges that the state has include high prevalence of food insecurity in households, um, low prevalence of exercise, and a high prevalence of obesity, which goes hand in hand. So um, more to come from uh, our leadership team, but I would entertain any questions um, about my brief re remarks, and I'm happy to be here today to help serve the state. Very good. Committee. Questions of the acting director. Representative Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering if you could send us a link to that full report. Yes, we can. Uh-huh. Liz, well, Liz Dunn will get that up to you all. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? And while we're sending out reports, could um, well, Megan, can you get us the Medicaid uh, recipient report just electronically, the one that we usually have, the one that has all the, uh, yeah, and the number of participants and, and all that? Okay, very good. Any further questions? You are off the hook. Thank you very much. Very good. Next, Director for oh, I guess you guessed wrong. <laughs> okay, Ashley Goss, Deputy Secretary Ashley, for Public Health. Good to see Health. you. Good to see you too, Chairman and Committee. So I think I can answer most of your questions that you asked specifically about WIC, about home visits, and some of the other questions. Um, so if I don't, just remind me what they were, and I'll cover them for you. So I'm going to start on page eight. I'm not going to read the entire slide to you. Um, you guys can review this, but these are um, some of our public health accomplishments outside of COVID. Um, we do other things besides COVID um, in our agency. So um, these, the, you can read the top six <clears throat> or top five, I'm sorry, that are listed there to see what those accomplishments are. I will talk a little bit about our newborn screening program. I think most of you are familiar with we have added um, things that we test for in our newborn screening program at the recommendation at the federal level. There's 35 components that are suggested that we screen for, and Kansas now screens for 34. Um, we are only missing one, which is the XALD um, component, it, which is a genetic disease that affects the nervous system and adrenal glands. Currently, one in about 17,000 births um, are diagnosed with that. We do, last year there was a bill introduced 
in the House. It was House Bill 2250, which would increase the cap for newborn screening. So it's currently set at $2.5 million. Over the last couple of years, we've come close to hitting that cap or exceeding the cap with our newborn screening. So the bill is suggesting that it be increased to $5 million. Currently, it's sitting below the line. But just for your awareness, that's where it's setting. Um, we do intend on adding this last component for newborn screening. Um, of course, we want to make sure that we'll be able to take care of it and cover it as newborn screening services are covered for infants in the state of Kansas. <clears throat> Next, um, one thing to note in our surveillance program or, or our Bureau of Epidemiology and Public Health Informatics program, we were accustomed to receiving about 140,000 electronic laboratory reports or ELR messages a year. Because of COVID, um, we've had to make adjustments. We now are receiving about 6 million messages a year, um, about 500,000 a month. Regarding our women, infants, and children program, that cash value did increase. And I will see if I have, I thought I had the dollar amount with me, but I want to say it went up to about $74. Kansas did opt to continue to stay with that increased cash value for our WIC services. In regard to our Bureau of Oral Health, you guys heard earlier that from Megan that there was a budget request to increase the oral health budget, $250,000. This is to help with the increase of student screenings in schools. So because of COVID, we've seen about a 55% decrease in student screenings that have happened across the state in our schools. Um, so this money would help um, get that program back going, get providers hired. Our CDC grant does not allow for that to happen. Moving on to page nine. Here you'll see a list of all six of the bureaus that are in the Division of Public Health. I'll cover briefly some of the services that are offered in each of the bureau. So in our Bureau of Community Health Systems, that's where the Safety Net Clinics program lives. Um, Representative Clifford, you asked about um, capital projects. I'll tell you tomorrow you'll hear from a partner that's asking for spark money specifically for that, for those, for the FQHCs. Health facilities, that's a program that is where we administer all of our health facility surveys. Um, so hospitals, ASCs, different facilities, not long-term care that lies in um, KDADS. And preparedness, our public health preparedness and our hospital preparedness program lies in that bureau as well, as well as radiation and our trauma center program. Next, Bureau of Epidemiology and Public Health Informatics. This is all things EPI. So again, even outside of COVID, that's where we track and investigate all reportable diseases. They're reportable by law, um, whether it's a, a foodborne disease, a waterborne disease, uh, COVID, a, a novel disease, whatever it may be, that's where we track it, research it, um, link cases, all the things. Also in that uh, bureau is vital statistics. So birth certificates, death certificates is, is where that lives as well. Our Bureau of Health Promotion is exactly that. They do a lot of things in the preventative space. So they work on cancer prevention, opioid prevention, palliative care, um, our community clinical linkages. This is also where our community health worker section is that we've been um, working on significantly over the last couple of years as well as injury violence and, I'm sorry, injury and violence prevention. Next, our Bureau of Disease Control and Prevention is where all of our infectious disease programs lie. So our STIs, um, KDHE is responsible for investigating and tracking anyone with a positive syphilis diagnosis or HIV. We do all of that tracking um, on behalf of the counties. Also in that Bureau is our immunization section and our prevention and care section. Our Bureau of Family Health, to sum that bureau up, it covers people from birth to death, essentially. So that's where our children and family section is, our early care and youth programs, nutrition and WIC, screening and surveillance, and then also our birth defect section and our newborn screening. And finally, Bureau of Oral Health is our smallest bureau. Um, they have less than five staff, but that's where our services for children and adults um, work takes place and also our oral health education. All right, moving on to page 10, home visiting. So you heard Megan report that there is in the governor's budget um, a $1.4 million enhancement for home visiting programs. This will be to increase our program. So Representative Helmer, I can tell you, and if you need additional information, we can certainly get it to you. 
Um, but in fiscal year 2019, we served about 6,400 families. And then um, in 2021, that dropped significantly to 3,600 because of COVID. So what we're planning to do um, with our $1.4 million is to essentially revamp the program and then increase the number of families that we're able to serve. In addition to that, we want to offer more of a universal program. So whether you're in Southeast Kansas or Southwest Kansas, you're getting the same services in a, from a home visiting program. All right, next, page 11. So recruitment and retention, you'll hear more about this on, you'll see it on the next slide. So KDHE is probably like no other agent, is like all other places of employment in Kansas. Um, employment is definitely hard to um, maintain. So I, I know that it was asked why we have an increase of approximately 70 employees. Those employees are temp workers um, that we've gotten through temp agencies to help with the pandemic. We will, we will not have them once the federal dollars go away. However, we still have openings that are funded and are very hard to fill. Um, we are constantly working with our HR department to come up with innovative ways to keep people wanting to work at the state. We're really great at training people um, and then they leave us because we've trained them up well and um, they're taken. So a common taker is the federal government. They like to take them from us as well. So. We're hoping that the 5% pay increase that the governor has put into her budget will stay. We think that will definitely go a long way with our staff. Um, and just there's some of our staffing is specific, specific type jobs such as RNs or analysts or um, data, data miners for lack of a better term, epidemiologists. So there's specific training and skill sets, which is why they're in high demand in other places. Um, so trying to keep them is, is continues to be a challenge. And I know you'll hear the same from Sarah. And then um, on the environment side, those committees will hear the same thing. It's all three of our divisions facing the same thing. So if you look at page 12, um, this goes to just kind of show what I spoke about a minute ago. Um, this is a graph that is showing you each bureau that I spoke about a moment ago by color and how long uh, on average staff stay. So as you can see, um, we're really good at maintaining staff through about five years. After five years is where our staff numbers really start to um, dwindle or people leave. So very thankful for the staff that stay, um, whether it's one year or five or 30, but would love to get our numbers past that five year mark to where we're seeing a longer tenure with us. All right, and I that's all I have for my slides. Um, Representative Carpenter, if you want me to stand for questions, I can, or I can wait. Next step is our CFO. Committee questions for Ashley. Representative Ruiz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do you know the bill number that you mentioned earlier? For newborn screening? Yes. I think it's 2250. 2250. Thank you. Yep, 2250. Representative Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, mine is a follow-up to that. Did we do a proviso last year? I was trying to screening. Remember. Yeah, we did. Okay. We did. And that's what has allowed us to continue um, the screening without having to worry too much. So, yes. And you said you added uh, um, one of the con conditions. Is that correct? We have one more to add. We added a couple, I want to say two years ago. Um, and there's one left to add out of the 35 that are recommended for screening. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, unlike the federal government, the counties cannot uh, have deficits in their budget at the end of the year. And, and to going back to your background at the Finney County Health Department, I wonder, uh, we always have an audit hit on, on WIC. Uh, is, is it paid in arrears or something, or why does it never match up with what we're actually doing? Thank you. I will get you the exact answer to that. Representative Clifford, um, I want to say that the year is lands on a different year and it is paid um, by ex expenses submitted, then it's paid back at 100%. But let me get you the timing on that. I remember that as well. And um, I could have easily explained it several years ago in front of you. Um, it's been a while. So let me check on it for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Howerton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So going back to my question with the advertising, like where does that fit in and I guess my concern is there's a whole lot of it, and I think, I don't know, why are we spending that much money on advertising? Are you talking specific COVID advertising? Yes, the okay. vaccination. Right. 
all of that money is federal money. It's and it's all FEMA reimbursed money. Is it specifically? For, does it say that it specific has specific for COVID? Yes. So could it be spent like advertising for nurses or encouraging people to fill those spots? No. So the the federal programs that we're getting. So it's like so the Division of Public Health, which Dan will go over here shortly, is the majority of our funding comes from federal grants and the federal grants are very specific as to what we can and can't do with them. So the COVID money is no different. Um, you would think that we that would make sense because of COVID, we are short of help, yes, but no, it's not an allowed expense. It's a very specific and very direct. I was just curious. I'm, I'm not against it. I just, there's a whole lot of it. Understood. So I was thinking if we could put that in a different direction, that would be great too. Some of it anyway. Right. Reserve Ballard. Uh, you answered part of my question about WIC, and I, I see it on my sh sheet here that the WIC participants, they increased it between 24 and 70. Okay, so when I see between 24 and 70, is that based on the number of children um, within that household? Because the majority of WIC are single women heads of households. So is that what it is? It says between 24 and 70. So is it somebody who gets 24, some get 70, or is it between? Let me get you the firm answer on that so I don't tell you incorrectly. Um, can we send that to you in an email? Okay. That, that's fine. And part of that, I think, is, be, is really because they're really aiming a lot at, you know, making sure that they're getting fresh vegetables, fresh food, and that kind of thing. And I will only just comment a little bit on the advertising uh, part. Um, it's been interesting because that advertising is not at the same level at all places because there's some people never see the advertising and they've wondered, you know, and then, then there's other places they are, but it's where the money is assigned and it's how they've decided to really do it. And what they have found out is in the areas where it continues, the rate has gone up in vaccinations and where they haven't received it, they either have gone down or they have stayed the same. So, I am a target. <laughs> so, it's really, so it's really interesting, you know, how it is, but it is very, very specific how that money has to be spent or the city or the county has to be return that money and no one's prepared to return anything these days. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee further questions of Ashley? Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now, oh, okay. Mark, or no, Dan. Yep. Dan Timish, Chief Fiscal Officer. Nope. I'm going to come back later and talk more about finances. I'm just covering page uh, 13 here in your deck. This pertains to staffing. And the question has been around, so we wanted to be accountable to it and just give you some uh, data here. This is specific to public health. And so you'll see each one of the bureaus listed, just showing what our staffing is currently in fiscal 22 versus what it was in fiscal 21. So it's a comparison to last year. Now, I apologize that there aren't totals. I'm not sure how those ended up not on the page, but if you look at the sort of the middle column there, FY22 total positions for public health, that comes to 478. And then uh, over to the second from the right, fiscal 21 totals to 404. So as somebody mentioned earlier, that's an increase of 74 positions. So the, the way you determine which of these are COVID versus non-COVID is you look at the funding and see how it, the positions are primarily being funded. There's no flag in the state's payroll system that says this person's COVID, this person is not. So when we looked at the funding, out of those 74, 60% or 45 of those positions are funded federally with COVID dollars. And as Ashley said earlier, you know many of those are temps and the intent would be that as the federal funding is spent and runs out, those are multi-year grants, will go through 2024 in many cases fiscal 2024, um, when the money goes away, those positions will either be repurposed because we do have a lot of vacancies or they will go away. Um, that's really it for that slide, unless there's questions on it, and I'll be back later. Many questions? Well, I've been watching that because I took all the heat in committee last year when we hired all those, so <laughs> thank you. Okay, very good. 
I'm, who's up next? <laughs> I don't have a accuracy. Mr. Chairman. Director Fertig. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, committee. Good to see you all again. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Division of Healthcare Finance, the Medicaid division. And um, our finance director, Mark Heim, will walk through some of the mechanics of our budget. So starting on, there we go, slide, let's flip over one to slide 16. So here we're highlighting some of the um, accomplishments that the Medicaid division enjoyed over the last year or so. And one that uh, those of you on the, on the Bethel Committee, you've already heard about this, but one of the things that we tried to do was take advantage of federal funding opportunities as much as we could. And the American Rescue Plan Act that you've heard a lot about, um, when that passed in March of 2021, one of the options that it allowed states to do was pay for um, COVID-19 vaccinations for Medicaid beneficiaries with 100% federal dollars. So we took advantage of that the first day we could on April 1st, 2021. So beginning in April 2021, all of the COVID-19 vaccinations for Medicaid beneficiaries were paid with 100% federal dollars. We also used that opportunity to increase our reimbursement rate for COVID-19 vaccinations. We had been paying $14.15 for an adult vaccine administration. We used this opportunity to match our rate to Medicare, which is $40 a shot. So providers were pretty happy to see a pretty good increase in the reimbursement rate for that service. And then in June of 2021, Medicare added a supplemental payment for COVID-19 vaccine administrations that take place in a patient's home. So if you have homebound folks, folks who have difficult difficulty with mobility, what have you, um, this is some additional funding so that you can send the provider into the patient's home if they're okay with that, and then they get reimbursed a little bit more for that. So we're pretty proud of that. That's saving the state um, a decent amount of money. And um, so we thought that was a good choice for us to make as stewards of public money. So another key accomplishment that we enjoyed was finally launching the Supports and Training for Employing People Successfully, or STEPS, pilot program on July 1st of 2021. So this is a pilot program for up to 500 Medicaid beneficiaries, and it's for individuals who have disabilities or certain behavioral health diagnoses, more serious ones like schizophrenia, to provide some pre-employment supports and on-the-job supports to help them find and keep competitive integrated employment. So um, we launched that program in July 1st, and we got the wonderful news about a week or so ago that the first participant in the STEPS program had achieved competitive integrated employment. They are working in the healthcare industry, um, earning a competitive wage with benefits. And the really great news is that since this individual started working in their job, their need for supports has gone down drastically. They used to have a plan of care that was several thousand dollars a month in attendant care services and all sorts of other services. Now their plan of care is, I think, $700 a month. So it's gone down significantly since they started working. So we're really excited about that and we're hoping to kind of replicate that success as we move forward. Uh, another major success was successfully transitioning the CanCare Clearinghouse contract from Maximus to our new contractor conduit effective in January of 2021. And uh, you may recall from a couple years ago, about five years ago, CanCare was all over the front page news. Um, there were lots of backlogs and eligibility processing for Medicaid, and the CanCare Clearinghouse was the subject of a lot of not great news attention. So um, it was really important that this transition go very, very smoothly. And we had very little time to do it because the pandemic got in the way, but we launched that um, as of January, 2021. And so far there've been no disruptions in service. There's not been any degradation in service. People aren't waiting longer to get their applications processed. So that's done really well. And those of you, um, who were on the Bethel Committee last Friday, you got to hear from the individual who's largely responsible for that, our Director of Eligibility, LaTanya Palmer. She did a fantastic job of leading that transition. Uh, another one of our major accomplishments was increasing the protected income limit for home and community-based services and PACE members. So this is the amount of money that folks in these programs are allowed to keep in order to receive Medicaid benefits. Anything they make over than that has to go back to the state to pay for their care. 
And for a number of years, that limit was $747. So if you were on the intellectual and dis developmental disability waiver, you could keep $747 a month. Every dollar you earned above that had to get paid back to the state to pay for your care. And disability advocates have been advocating for years to increase that. So a couple years ago, the legislature included funding to increase the protected income limit to $1,177, which was huge. That was very, very well received. And last year, as you may recall, um, we also received funding to increase it to 300% of SSI. So right now that's closer to about $2,300, $2,400 a month. So that's money that folks who are largely elderly and disabled can keep so that they can live safely, you know, have safe housing. Um, you know, they can buy new shoes if they need new shoes. They can buy healthy food if they need new um, healthy food. And so what's notable here is that before that change, we had about 2,500 Medicaid beneficiaries who owed money to the state through their client obligation. Um, once the protected income limit was raised to 300% of SSI, that number's down to 185. So we've eliminated the, the client obligation for over 99% of HCBS and PACE members. So that's very, very exciting. And then, you know, lastly, we did maintain our success in eliminating the CanCare application backlog, which is no small, no small feats. So we're pretty proud about that. Next slide, please. So as Megan um, discussed in our budget overview, uh, we are in the process of launching a new Medicaid fiscal system. This is a massively complicated system that contains all the data related to every single payment we made to managed care organizations. Right now, we've got over 500,000 Medicaid members, so a lot of payments go out every single month. They have to be accurate. If we need to make a correction, that needs to be done correctly. It also contains all of the encounter data that we receive from MCOs. So if you have a Medicaid member, they go to the doctor, they run a couple labs, the claim goes to the MCOs, they pay it. All that data gets transmitted to the state. So it's this system that manages the finance and it can also tell us what services folks on Medicaid are accessing. So it's really, really key. It's a backbone of our Medicaid system. And we're in the process of updating it and uh, launch is currently scheduled for April. And so we're hoping that once that is launched, we'll be able to modernize our approach to using data in the Medicaid program. Next slide, please. So as Ashley Goss indicated, um, like in public health and the Division of Healthcare Finance, employer recruitment and retention is challenging. Um, Ashley had indicated that, you know, typically folks get, um, you know, we train them up on the state side and then they get recruited away in our division our folks are more likely to get recruited away by private insurance companies. So we train them up, they learn a lot about insurance, they learn a lot about Medicaid, and then they get higher paying job elsewhere. So it can be challenging for us to hang on to staff. I would echo Ashley Goss's remarks that, you know, we would welcome um, the employee salary increase that the governor recommended in her budget. We think that would help us quite a bit. Next slide, please. There it is. Okay. So this chart is going to mimic public health quite a bit. You see that um, unlike public health, the Division of Healthcare Finance, we've got a pretty decent number of staff who've been with us for over 10 years. And I think that's because for a lot of, there are some folks on our staff for whom Medicaid is really a calling. It, it just really is. And they've stuck through the program through thick and thin. You know, we have eight staff members who've been with us for over 35 years, which is pretty remarkable. So that's kind of a testament to the dedication we have among our staff. The number that concerns me is the one to five year number that shows that, you know, after one to five years, we lose a lot of folks. So we can bring them in, train them up, they learn very, very valuable skills, and then we lose them. And that's kind of the number that we're hoping to make a dent in so that we can see more folks in the five to 10 year range and beyond. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my portion of the presentation. I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Committee questions. Representative Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious at the KMMS system, I think. Um, so how will that, um, will you have the data for the, the IDD waiver and what services they're using? And then will you also include the folks who are on the wait list? Um, 
Oh, is that Kate Adds? Well, Mr. Chairman, we, we do, the, the system will have access to that. So we will see um, when the MCOs pay a provider for someone who's on the IDD waiver, we will see what services they're accessing. So it does include that information as well. Folks who are on the IDD waiver wait list, assuming that they're on Medicaid currently, um, that you know they're already eligible for base Medicaid, um, then we would have that information as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we get into this with the waivers and Medicaid. You know, I think the new numbers are on the waivers. It's like 70% of them are on Medicaid. Well, that's separate money than the waiver is. So it's it gets kind of wicked here pretty soon. And I, I just about asked the question about, well, about Maximus because Keep in mind that we took in almost 300 employees to do the long-term care. And I was asking, thinking about that, and I thought, oh, that's KDADS. So anyway, it gets complicated here, folks. And don't be afraid to ask questions about where the barriers are. <laughs> okay. Committee, further questions for KDAG Health? Okay. Seeing none, our finance director, Mark Heim, is up next, so I will tag him in. Thank you. The round robin of KDHE folks today. Yeah, very good. Mark, good to see you again. Nice. Apologize for putting you on the spot the other day on uh, yeah, I, WebEx. but I knew you meant in a good way, right? I did. That was kind of fun, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was your first day on the job, you know. Just wanted you to understand what you were it got yourself into. <laughs> I'd be All right. worried if you didn't pick on me. That's um, very so good. Thank you. Mr. Thank you for being here. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, and thank you, members of the committee. I am Mark Heim, Finance Director for um, Healthcare Finance. And so my presentation starts on slide 20. Um, and this first slide just points out a few things about the caseload process. So um, we do have what we call, we refer to as the spring caseload, fall caseload, um, Spring caseload usually happens right around the middle of April, and the fall caseload happens um, right around the middle of October. Those are what we shoot for. Um, this is uh, where we um, determine and do our projections for our needs for funding for caseload, and then what we think the numbers are going to be in terms of um, the, uh, overall beneficiaries. This uh, process includes not only KDHE, KDADS is involved, um, DCF is involved. Uh, Megan is part of it as um, legislative research. Division of Budget is also a, a part of this group. So um, it is a fair size group that are that are coming up with these projections. Um, as we have, as it changes, you know, year to year and uh, each six months, um, what we're looking at kind of there at the bottom three bullet points I have. Um, again, the population and membership shifts. Um, if there have been any program updates, and those can be come from the legislature, they can be internal policies, and um, they can be federally, uh, you know, mandated as well. So all of those can change um, what what the estimate will be. And then something you've heard about today a little bit, and um, I know it's of uh, great interest for the chairman, is the um, FMAP. And so I will talk about that a little bit more as we as we move forward. On slide 21, this is uh, this bar graph just kind of shows you. So, you know that the consensus group, it, or the the population, Medicaid population, is a is obviously obviously a significant number. So this shows you the members and the expenditure. So in terms of the members, where is the membership? Where are the where are the numbers? And as this shows you, the members are in the um, families and children. Um, but actually, the expenditures, they are, they are the lowest in terms of the expenditures. So the expenditures are more with the disabled and the elderly population. So expenditures fall with that segment, even though the, by far the largest portion of the Medicaid population is in, is in children and parents. Um, actually, 76% of the beneficiaries are in the children and parents um, population. So if you flip to slide 22, this is kind of another look at that. Um, and, and as a, the comment at the top there, the previous slide shows about 76% of the beneficiaries in uh, fiscal year, that state fiscal year 21, were in um, children and families. 
So if you look at the, the chart there in the middle of the page on the far right column, just to show you where this comes from, if you look at the line for families, 276,000, <clears> the CHIP population at 50,000, and then the foster care and adoption at 19,000. So those three groups are what we're looking at when we're talking about the 76%. The and that's the those three numbers. If you add those up, you come up with the 347,000. <clears> Flipping to slide 23, um, this is kind of a busy page, but again, so here we are. This is a little bit more in-depth look at the FMAP, um, the, the Federal Medical Assistance Percentage. So I'll point your, or draw your attention right to the middle of the page, and specifically, if you look at line 2020. So actually, if you look at 18 and 19, um, you can see it's a little cleaner line there. So it just gives you the FMAP. Um, we were at 54%. In 2019, we were at 57%. Okay, so then next line in 2020, um, and here comes COVID and we have a split FMAP. So in 2020, for instance, we would have been at 59%, but with the uh, inception of the public health emergency, and this is where the 6.2% comes in, so we went from 59 to 65%. Um, and, th and that 62 it is a, uh, it's a very substantial amount. And Megan talked about that a little bit in her overview, but we are now eight quarters into having that 6.2, that additional 6.2%. And so, as Megan talked about, um, and I know she mentioned her chart was in the handout wasn't quite the latest, but we are up to um, just over a half billion dollars due to that additional 6.2%. And um, that's across the state as a whole. So KDADS, KDHE, um, and Children and Family all involved in that number. But um, so, again, that's, that's the reason for the split. You can see we're, we're up to 2022. We have it that, again, we would be at 60% with the additional 6.2. We're at, um, we are 66.36. So moving to slide 24, um, and again, you heard Megan talk about these, uh, uh, some of these as well. So the, um, our uh, supplementals for 2022 and our enhancements for um, 2023. So the first one is the um, extension of Medicaid for pregnant women, and the idea here would be to start this April 1st. Um, we are looking at some other states who are doing this. Uh, Texas, Tennessee, South Carolina um, are all um, have started on this, and so we're uh, monitoring them to see what they're doing and how they're progressing. Um, the second bullet point uh, I have there are, is money we're asking for for administrative hearing services. So the, there's federal law that requires we offer the opportunity for uh, a fair hearing to be held if it's requested. Um, state law requires that we use the state's office of administrative hearing. So due to some increases in their costs um, that were unanticipated for us, um, that's, that's where this request come from. And I'm, I might point out as I go along, um, this one, for instance, <clears throat> excuse me, is a 50-50 match. So states at 50 and the, and the federal government's at 50%. On the third and fourth bullet point are some additional positions that we're asking for. The, um, we have three positions in Medicaid eligibility. So these would be more, or they're going to, they're going to help beef up our program integrity and for conducting internal audits. So we, um, routinely undergo audits, whether it be um, usually CMS related or CMS initiated. So we feel like if we can strengthen that staff, we can help eliminate findings, catch them before they become findings, and then also help with um, any corrective actions, implementing corrective actions that, that we get from um, CMS, for example. The bottom bullet point, those two positions, that is a pharmacist and a pharmacy tech for our um, Medicaid pharmacy program. So this program, it's about, it's just over a half billion dollar program. Right now we have three employees in that, at that program. And, and it's another one. We, we need to beef up the, um, our staff there to, to do better oversight, help us do additional oversight. And, uh, cause it is a significant part of our program. And I would mention <clears throat> on those, 
positions, both both lines there, those are 75-25. So the state's 25% brings in the 75% from the federal government. So that's a bit full. Five? Yeah. And then flipping to page 25, um, so our budget enhancement requests for the out year, um, and, and you've, you've heard about most of these in, in, the, in the presentation today already, but the first one, again, the extension of um, the 60 days to 12 months um, for uh, Medicaid for pro pregnant women. And, you know, again, um, there's, and I think you'll, Hear more about this tomorrow, but a lot of benefit there for both the, the mom and baby. So, um, second one and the third bullet point again: the positions, um, two, three for eligibility and two for pharmacy oversight. And moving down to the fourth bullet point, so the governor has recommended nineteen million dollars um, state general fund for the expansion of Medicaid in January of twenty twenty three. Um, that would be six months of the fiscal year, 2023. And Megan touched on this as well. Um, this would, states have the option now of expanding, would bring us that additional 5% on the existing population. And then um, it'd be a 90-10 split on the expansion population. So a couple pretty uh, significant incentives there for expanding, for states that expand now. And then the final bullet point, um, again, th and there was a question about this. This is the Kim's project. So yes, um, it has been pushed back from January to April. Um, and it's a 12 month certification process with CMS. So during that, and I know this was mentioned, but I think maybe one part that wasn't mentioned. So this is, this is matched at 75-25. During that certification process, it drops to 50-50. So for that, and it's at least a year certification so during that certification while that's ongoing um, we lose a significant share of match now once the project is certified and up and going we can uh, retroactively claim that uh, share that that we weren't eligible during the certification i believe with that mr chairman um, that was my last slide so i can certainly stand for questions or committee questions Representative Helmer. I mean, why 60 days to 12? I might uh, <laughs> cheat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody who would speak to it much better than I, that piece. <laughs> sure, no problem. Mr. Chairman, uh, Sarah Freddick, State Medicaid Director. Um, so what we're talking about is extending eligibility for women in the pregnant women eligibility group. Um, right now, their eligibility ends about 60 days postpartum. So what this would do is give them 10 more months of eligibility to round out that first year of new motherhood. So right now, Medicaid automatically covers a baby born to a Medicaid mom for that first 12 months of life. And we're kind of looking to match mom with baby. So that's what we'd be paying for, 10, other, 10 extra months of insurance coverage, essentially, for those new moms. And it, this, we've got about 14 to 15,000 women a year who gain eligibility for Medicaid through the Pregnant Women Eligibility Group. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what we're talking about is 12 months total. So th this, this request would add 10 months to what they already get. Right now, their, their eligibility is terminated about 60 days or two months postpartum, we'd be giving them 10 more months so that they have 12 full months postpartum. <laughs> yeah, sure, no problem. Any further questions? Representative Ballard. Mm-hmm.
Very good committee. So we would concur, Mr. Other Chairman. questions? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Representative Clifford. Uh, on the uh, page 25, the, the uh, expansion population is, is a 90-10 match, but does it get this extra 6.2 during the public health emergency? It, the 6.2 helps us as long as the public health emergency stays in effect, right? So as of now, <clears throat> excuse me, and I don't, I, I think April, maybe April was mentioned, but as of now, the anticipate, anticipation is that PHE would end on April 16th, and expansion wouldn't go live until, I mean, at the earliest, we're saying 2023, so doubtful that, I, you know, that the PHE would be in effect that long. That's quite a ways away, but. Okay. And, and I might add, that's for four quarters, two years, that extra 5%, then it would go back to the 90-10 that other states have now. Eight quarters, right. Um, committee, further questions? Well, committee, one reason why I kind of harp on this F map is because, you know, the fact of the matter is that we've offset $530 million worth of SGF savings by collecting the, by, by this increased F map. And the only reason I say that is because if you take that out of our budget, it's going to bill, we're going to start paying that bill when the health insurance or the, when it ends in April or whenever it ends. So that's 500 more million dollars that we're going to pay that we normally, we haven't paid for the last two years. So that's all I'm saying about that is you take that off of our ending balance and we're not as rich as we think we are is all I'm saying. So that's why I harp on that. I just don't want folks to forget when we start talking about uh, sales tax on food and doing this and doing that. We've got to remember that that bill will do, be due. So anyway, enough of that. Thank you very much, Mark, for being here. Thank you. All right, Dan, you up next. Okay, I think my slide here starts on page 27. <clears throat> These four graphs are basically just going to, in pie chart form, show you by fiscal year our total funding sources where they're coming from and then our total expenditures so on slide 27 this is fiscal 22 health funding sources so for all the programs and divisions we just talked about our federal funds are 65 percent this is primarily the f map that we've been talking about on medicaid it's also the 6.2 percent additional f map um, all of our covid Funding that we've received from the federal government is in this number, um, 50 million for the frontline hospitals we spoke about earlier, and then the public health portion. So in a normal year, the federal share for KDHE is about 60% of health, and this year it's close to 66, so you'll see the increase there. The second largest funding source is SGF at, at roughly 21%, followed by fee funds, I'll give you a sense of what that is. Much of that comes from the Division of Healthcare Finance. It's things like our drug rebate program, our intergovernmental transfers, the provider assistance fees, and the privilege fees that come from the MCOs. And then in public health, we have an Office of Vital Statistics Civil Registration Fee Fund, a District Coroner Fee Fund, Radiation Control. So the agency does have a number of fee funds. And then it's followed up next by CIF, which is 7.2. That's our Children's Initiative Fund. Um, and then uh, lastly, trust, uh, trust gifts, private donations, et cetera. Next slide then, same, in, same fiscal year, 22, looking at our health expenditures. Um, this is an interesting one. You'll see that 89% roughly of our expenditures are what we call aid and assistance. So that is our Medicaid and CHIP programs. And then it's also all of the aid to local programs within the Division of Public Health. And then the remaining 21% breaks out amongst everything else. Um, contractual services is $312 million. That would be things like the eligibility clearinghouse, our keys and chem system support. Um, all the contract lab costs that we incurred through COVID would be in that number. Next would be salary and wages at 81 million. And then we have capital outlay and commodities. The next slide is gonna look very much similar for our funding sources. Um, I will mention here in the federal number, as Mark just mentioned, is half a year of Medicaid expansion is included in that 2.7 billion in federal funds. And then on the SGF, 
Um, we recognize the 19 million related to Medicaid expansion, but it's offset by this um, sweetener, the FMAP sweetener, which is a reduction of 5% in FMAP on the base population if we were to expand Medicaid, and that continues for eight quarters. So that nets, as Mark showed you, on, showed you, I believe, on his prior slide, the $87.5 million reduction in SGF for expanding FMAP, or for expanding Medicaid, uh, is FMAP savings. On the next slide, then, related to fiscal 23 expenditures, um, very much, again, in line with what we just showed, 90% aid and assistance, and then everything else. Um, if we go on, then, to the next slide, we always like to break out for you the SGF that goes into public health because there's an interesting call out here. You'll see that in each fiscal year we have between eight and nine million dollars in SGF that is matched by the federal government within the public health uh, space. Um, that draws down about three and a half times the amount. So if you look at fiscal 22, that nine million dollars there in SGF draws down 31 million in federal funds. And in fiscal 23, the $8.3 million in SGF draws down roughly $31 million in federal funds. So that's a good leveraging of our state general dollars to draw down federal funds. The balance then of the public health SGF that is non-match is footnoted there at the bottom. The, the, the biggest um, program supported with that is our primary care program throughout the state. And then also our aid to local tiny K maintenance of effort and then everything else. And then the rest of the deck here is what Megan covered. It's just a repeat of what's in the slide deck that you have, and it's a breakout of the COVID-related funding that the agency received in the two fiscal years here in questions, fiscal 22 and 23, along with the description. So that's the end of my pages. Very good. Committee questions? Sorry, I, I missed the math on if we expand, we, we lose $87 million somehow. Let me repeat that. Right. So the sweetener... Would you like to talk about this? The sweetener for Medicaid expansion through the ARPA legislation is that any state that, that has currently not yet expanded, were they to expand Medicaid, they would receive an extra 5% FMAP on the base population. So you mentioned earlier 90% on the expansion population. This would be an initial 5% on the base population for eight quarters. And so for half a year of fiscal 23, that was worth $87.5 million were we to expand Medicaid. And it would continue then for the following six quarters after that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Very good, Dan. Thank you for being here. Committee, uh, tomorrow we will do uh, public hearings on KDHE's budget.